for. I beg you. I plead with you. I desire for you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Glory. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that's good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I've used that scripture twice in the meeting, but now I want to take its twin brother. And I jump many, many scriptures and read these words. Let every soul, let every soul be subject unto higher powers. For there is no power but of God, and the powers that be ordained of God. First, he spake about the body, the mind, and then he speaks about so for whosoever therefore resist the power resist the ordinance of God and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation Holy Spirit Oh, hallelujah. Father, I feel your presence so evident. Your spirit is so beautiful. And I feel that something glorious shall happen to this audience. Tonight, may they not see Jerry B. But may they behold the Christ that we shall exalt and shall praise in this hour. That when we leave this place, our bodies, our minds shall be committed to you, O Lord. But more than that, that our souls have yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, Father, save the lost. Renew and restore, Father, that critter that is backslidden. And Father, I pray to fill the believer with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when we leave this church tonight, we shall know that we have been touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. For I ask and I believe and I know because I ask in the names of that blessed, beautiful, holy trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all of God's sweet children said, Amen and Amen. You may be seated. I would love to stand before this audience right now and look at your beautiful faces and be able to reach way down on the twilight zone of your soul and tell you this. I would love to be able to say to you, audience, I understand God. I know all about Him. I have had a revelation of God and I want to share it with you. But that is not mine to give. And that is not mine to say. And that is not mine to share. For God is still God. And no earth creature will ever understand His powers, His wisdom, 
and you'll never be able to see all of his glory. That's his. 23 years ago, as a lad, I finally said, yes, I'll preach the gospel. At four and a half years of age, I began to pray for the sick. My father was spellbound as he would take me on visitation. And when I would lay my little hand on a fevered brow, the Lord Jesus Christ would heal. But 23 years ago, I told God something that I meant. Because I learned something that is most profound. God will share everything he has with we earth creatures. He will share with us every blessing that is in the catalog of glory. But there's one thing that he refuses to share with any of us. And that is his glory. That's his and his alone. And he deserves all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. But somewhere along the way we've gotten sidetracked and we feel like that we deserve the honor, the glory, the applause, the thank yous, and all of that marvelous charisma that goes along with it. But that belongs to God. And we must leave that in God's hand. Now then, I could deal with an area tonight in God's holy word that I just read to you. I beseech you therefore, brethren, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. And a lot of you folks would get happy, you'd shout, you'd weep, you'd cry, you'd get beside yourself and man, I believe in that. But neighbor, there's a step that's just one step further that we must do. And that's where we yield to the power of the Holy Spirit to minister to our souls. God's power is a very serious thing. I do not understand it. I do not know how it comes and I do not know how it goes. I don't know how to control it. I don't know how to bring it down. I don't know any of those formulas. But I know when I feel it. And I know when it's near. And any time I feel it, I try to get right smack dab in the middle of it. And say, God, fill me one more time with your Holy Ghost power. Men have tried to streamline it. They've tried to control it. They've tried to harness it. They've tried to put it in a box. They've tried to place it in a container. They've tried to commercialize it. But neighbor, no man knoweth how to touch the power of God. That belongs unto him. Say amen. Last Thursday evening here in the beautiful hills of Kentucky, two little boys were walking across the field. And a bolt of lightning struck. One child was knocked unconscious. He is still in intensive care. The other child was only partially touched by lightning. But I'm not talking about lightning from the sky. I'm not talking about the thing that the wind would bring or a storm would bring to pass. I'm talking about that sweet, still Holy Spirit that only God can give and God can take away. But God is very emphatic about something that really bothers me this moment. As I read to you tonight the next verse where it said, Let every soul be subject to higher powers, for there is no powers but of God and be ordained of God. Then I read to you the second verse. Whosoever therefore resists, bringeth unto himself damnation. You see, it puts us in a very serious light. It is saying, man, don't mess around with God. Don't play with his spirit, his power, his glory. Don't 
be guilty of resisting when it comes by. Because if you do, you receive unto yourself damnation. I can remember in my lifetime that very rarely did you ever hear of anyone very ill or very sick in the church. Oh, they'd have chicken pox and the measles and those kind of things. But you never heard anybody in the church dying of cancer. You never had to go to the hospital and visit 15 people every day in different rooms because they were ill. I don't know what happened. One year in my father's church, they begin to take surveys. And for four years in a row, we didn't lose one saint by death, and not one soul member of my dad's church was in the hospital. There may be a secret we're about to uncover. There may be something that we're about to tap. For the Bible said, Woe unto him that resists the power of God, for he bringeth unto himself damnation. The power of God may be that power that gives us ability to resist illness, uh, to resist the powers of the enemy, to resist the things that may come our way if we can learn to live in the realm of the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, doctor, you're an educated man. You're a man that's got a brain up there that's all tampered with. But I also have my doctorate, but I don't like to go around telling it. But did you know what? You can never find anywhere in the mother church where they had death except when two members farmed around. Ananias and Sapphira. And neighbor, they were dead in just a few minutes apart. I look at Ananias. He probably was a member of the Full Gospel Fellowship. Sister Sapphira was probably a member of the Women's of Glitter. And they were Pentecostal tongue-talking saints that had probably come out of the first high church when Pentecost moved in Jerusalem. But they sold a piece of land and it got them in trouble because they began to mess around with the power of God. You see, no longer do we hear from our pulpits to fear God. No longer do we hear a preacher ever to stand up here and tell you, you better not mess around with God's power. Neighbor, we live a life that we want to live. It's loose. We come and go and do our thing, and we never fear that God is still there, and he has an eye watching you, whatever you do. Say amen. And I can see Sapphire at home. Sapphire thought, well, he's already at church, and I'm not going to worry about it. And I can see her putting on her Wednesday night wig and getting her eyelashes all put in place uh, and her ears uh, with all those jewels in them. Uh, and she thought, boy, I've got it made. But neighbor, God said, I want to tell you something, woman. I'm going to make you an example here in the mother church of Jerusalem. You don't mess around with my Holy Ghost and power. I'll show you in a moment. You're going to be a dead sister. I am. Somebody ag me on a little bit. Oh, the black saints got blessed in this church last night, but you must have lost today. This is sad day. Come on, ag me on, children. I'm preaching the truth. We do not know how dangerous we live when we once enjoyed the charisma, the power, the spirit, the love, the dimension of all of God's avenues. And then we say, now God, don't bother me. I'm too blessed now, and now I don't need it. Neighbor, the more blessings you have, the more blessings God gives, the more glory you see, the more financial blessings you have, the more of God you need to direct you and keep you where you belong. Woe <laughs> unto him. that touched the power of God. Now we can have church. My main amen are finally got here. Glory, honey, I just didn't think you was going to make it. I thought that old Buick must have broke down or had a flat. We need to realize what privileged people we are that God was so gracious to share with us that same spirit, that same power, that same momentum that Jesus Christ
Christ walked on earth with for 33 glorious years. Amen. But we take it for granted. Well, bless God, I'm saved, sanctified, and filled. With what? Look at the first church of Jerusalem. 5,000 were added to the church daily. Somebody said the other night that probably the membership reached up to 120,000 in less than a year. But neighbor, we Christians tonight are playing spiritual roulette. We are playing with a power that we better be careful with or God's going to say, all right, honey, you played around, you messed around, you played church, you played religion, you played all of this, but I'm through with your playing. Boom! And God's damnation becomes your part. Now, I'm not a crepe hanger. I'm a love preacher. And I don't like to preach judgment sermons. And I don't like these people who are always putting us under condemnation and putting us under fear and bondage. But neighbor, we need to be so cautious how we react to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Some of you old-fashioned Pentecostals tonight, I want you to think about what I'm going to tell you now. Now, I'm not going to preach in this revival. I only have one service left, and I'm going to talk in that one too. But I want to tell you something that Pentecostal folks used to reverence God. Isn't it quiet, this Presbyterian assembly? There was a day that we reverenced God and we respected Him and we kept Him in His proper place. Divers' tongues would come forth in the service. And man, everybody would bow their head and close their eyes. And would hardly breathe because we realized that we were hearing direct from the throne room of glory. But look at it today. When divers' tongues come, that's the time for you to get up and go to the garden where nobody can watch you. Mm -hmm. That's the time you have to take the youngin out to read the paper. That's the time you change gum and get a new dip and a new flavor. But when we had the real genuine power of God, we were even afraid to chew gum in the house of God because we were afraid we might miss something that God would send by. I smell hide burning. You think it's hot in here, honey. It's not the temperature. It's the sermon. But I'm digging right down where you live, honey, and I'm going to try to cut the branch off that you're sitting on that you'll have to climb up one round higher in God's tree. But we are so guilty of resisting the power of God. I went to a church not long ago, and the pastor said to me, Now, Jeremy, don't expect me to get too emotional during the meeting. The meeting lasted for 14 weeks. Over 100,000 people attended the crusade. The church completely was turned around and made a brand new church. I mean, they came from far and from near. And one night a big lady came through the meeting. I mean, she was about a 24 double R. She was big. A beautiful big woman. And all of a sudden, she got about three feet from me. And God began to do an adjustment on her spinal cord. And her spine began to jerk. And all the it was I never saw such gyrations in my life. And all of a sudden, I smiled. And God said, you don't smile at my power, Jeremy Walker. And God began to do the same thing to me. And I thought God was going to break my neck. My head popped back and forth. I thought I was a registered church of God. I never got such a jerking in my life. And I said, God, I'll never smile again when somebody's having a spell. Go ahead, Lord. I'll be nice. After church, the preacher said to me, Brother Walker, <laughs> he said, I really got a kick out of God giving you a good jerk tonight. He said, but you'll never see me act that way. I said, oh, really? 
the next morning I was in a board meeting with my Lord and I said daddy God I don't understand why you did that last night I've never jerked that way before in my life I am I'm just not very emotional father you know that I'm very dignified and polished because I'm a blue blood now God I'm grateful that I had it but I'm not going to ask you to give it back to me tonight but I am going to ask you to suck it to the pastor I believe you would because you're just that sweet you're just that precious and you know what the next night there were about 200 folks in the healing line the auditorium had been filled since 4 o'clock in the afternoon they had sat for three and a half hours waiting for the service to start the crowd had come from far and near an ice storm was on but it didn't bother folks getting to church honey we were having church and that night a man came through the healing line and he had a great big growth right here on his nose it looked like a, a strawberry sitting up there and all of a sudden I said in the name of Jesus mm, and that thing vanished and all of a sudden daddy God said now this is the time I'm going to show the dignified pastor who I am and God grabbed him by the seat of the breeches and the nap of the neck and honey he looked like a kangaroo that had been plugged into 440 volts God shook him completely out of his shoes that very pastor talked to me this week about coming back for a meeting and I will guarantee that any of you could ask him about being jerked the power of God he said brother don't fight it don't criticize it because God will do it to you I am a member that knows that God will suck his power to you we're resisting the very thing we need we become high minded we're haughty we have stiff necks uh, we've got minds who control God we say now God uh, I'm not going to do that somebody might talk about me they might criticize me honey I don't give a rip uh, when the power of the Holy Ghost is passing by reach out and take a hold uh, and say God uh, let it be me that you're going to use uh, with the moving of your spirit say amen Woe unto him that resist the power of the almighty God. We charismatic Pentecostal saints who've been filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we think we control it. But neighbor, we need to let him control us. We think that we have the authority to say when, how, and do it, and we do it that way. But neighbor, when the sweet Holy Spirit passes by, it may be a weeping service, it may be a laughing service, it may be a running service, it may be a leaping service, it may be a shouting service, it may be a tongue meeting, but my God, when it moves by, say, Lord, suck it to me. Let me be the vessel that you can use in this moment. Say amen. We were in a meeting in Florida and the pastor's wife said now I don't understand all this going on in this church brother walkers come here and the folks are getting healed and people are being delivered and I've never seen the building so filled and I've never seen all that but she said now when it comes start the moving of the spirit just leave me out because I want no part of it I thought oh, oh honey you are just now pushing yourself in the place that God may try you one more time. And one night, God got a hold of that dignified sister and the evangelist and the pastor's wife danced in the spirit for 40 minutes without ever missing a lick. They call us Fred Astaire and something else. I forgot the other name they called us. But we were something else. It was the Holy Ghost. I'm only speaking about the demonstration of the power. But neighbor, there's another kind of power of God that I love. It's when you can hear the air conditioning pulleys pulling cold air into a building. 
but the saints of God are spellbound by the quietness, the touch of the Holy Spirit. I see some of you saints tonight from Louisville. I love you. And I'm coming home in just a few days, so get ready. But I tell you tonight that I was in Louisville a couple of years ago. And one night in one of those meetings, there wasn't a child crying. There wasn't a child whimpering. The young people were not moving or stirring. And all I did was come to the platform and stood with my arms outstretched and never said a word and the altars filled with sinners and they were saved. Who are we? Who are we? That we have the authority to resist the very thing that we need. Who are we? To dictate to God and say, God, if you do it my way, I'll be a part of it. But I am convinced that I have given my body a living sacrifice. That when his spirit moves by anything he wants out of Jeroboam, he's got it. But there's something about the power of God that has always intrigued me. It never brings attention to anyone. It always glorifies and edifies the kingdom of the Almighty God. We live in a day that it scares me, and I hate to use the word frightened or fear. But we live in a day that a lot of people have been filled with the Holy Spirit. They speak with divers tongues. And for some reason they feel like they've been ordained to go around and meddle in everybody's lives. And they've got all these personal prophecies. You better watch it, honey. When there's more than three tongues and in interpretation in any one service, there's something wrong. Read your book by three. And I went to a church a few weeks ago and I counted 31 prophecies given over individuals in that audience. Neighbor God does not peddle or cheapen His marvelous gifts that operate by His Spirit and His Spirit alone. And I'm looking at these shattered lives. John, I'm looking at these shipwrecks. And I'm looking at these people who somebody has tampered and meddled with. But neighbor, my Bible says lay hands on no man suddenly. A lady came to me not long ago and she said, Brother Walker, God's revealed to me that I'm going to be your mother-in-law. I said, really? That thing made me nervous. And I thought, God, you're not going to stool pigeon on me and do something under the cover behind my back? I've been a good boy. Now, God, I would love to have a wife, but I do think I have a, 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 a say in the matter, don't you? But I mean mama. Mama. Six foot three, hundred pounds, looked at me and she said, Man, God's beamed in on you and you're mine. That made me nervous. I was preaching a great camp meeting where it was packed and jammed. And I went back to the hotel that night and I said, Now, God, we've got to have a talk. Now, I want you to send me a wife. That's all right. But God, I think that I have a right to court her, hold her hand, and talk trash in her ear. But God, don't just put somebody off of me wholesale. 
because I'm doing all right by myself. But you know what? The next morning I got up and I played beauty shop. I took my motor car and had it shampooed. And that next night I went to camp meeting. And the superintendent said to me, Brother Walk, you seem to be a bit nervous. I said, if you only knew. Every night before I preach, I've had it all of these years. I've never lost it. I don't have butterflies. I got buzzards that just go off and up and down in my insides. I die a thousand times. And I looked over that crowd of about 5,000 people. And I looked up every aisle and every pew. No, I didn't say that, Pastor. I didn't bother God with that. Because I'm afraid he would have answered me. Yes. And you all of a sudden, I cleared the entire audience, row by row. And I said, God, you want to know the truth? I don't see one in this audience I'd have. It was hard to preach that night because I knew that after service I was going to meet mama. I said, sister, God loves me more than that. She got mad at me. I don't know why she did. But neighbor, we have taken the authority that we think we can deal with somebody's life. You better get out of people's lives and let God be the dealer, the dictator, the ruler, the leader, the healer, the teacher, the healer that only God can do. Oh, but Brother Walker, I went to a prayer meeting and I, I've been praying for God to give me something deep in the spirit. Honey, you drowned. You don't need something deep in the spirit. You just need that small, still voice to say, You're my child. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, it hasn't hit your area, but it's going on. And I stand before you as honest as honest can be. I'm fearful for God's super spiritual saints because they're getting sidelined into dealing in areas that's none of their business. And a lady came to me only last week in the camp meeting and she said, Brother Walker, I have driven all the way from Tulsa. And she said, at times I could not see the highway for the tears that fell from my eyes. Said, I went to a ladies' prayer group and said, one of the sisters told me that I was living out of God's will and I had the wrong husband and I had to get rid of him and she named the name of my new one. Neighbor, that's dangerous. And God does not cause confusion. He is not a home breaker. He's a home provider. He's the man that makes the home have unity and love and spirit and the power of his love is manifest in that home. He's not one of confusion. And I said, sweetheart, do you love your husband? She said, Brother Walker, he's an alcoholic. He's as mean as the devil, but I love him. I said, don't you leave him. He's yours till death does you part. And she lit up and she said, now, I've got my program straightened out. I'm going to start believing for God to save his soul. When these people start coming to you and say, The Lord told me so. Say, Hop, hold it, honey. I haven't heard from him yet. 
You quit letting men mess in your life. If it's the Holy Spirit, it'll register. It'll confirm. You may have all received the message. You may have all received the warning. You may have all received the revelation. And by the words of two or three, it'll be a witness unto you that it's the truth. And when you've got that witness, uh, honey, you can stand on that and say, I know in whom I believe that I, he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The power of God. We don't play with the power of God. We don't meddle with the mysteries of God. We don't step in the twilight zone and say, God, let me rule it now and do it my way. I don't understand divine healing. I stand and at many times I feel like I am stripped from as a man as I say, God, I don't understand the healing virtue. I don't know why in the world, God, you ever chose me to enjoy that beautiful gift. I know that I'm not a healer. I couldn't heal a fly that a bursting headache. I couldn't heal a mosquito that a broken landing gear. But I have God that I have a God that made both of them. But we need to get our priorities back in proper perspective and say, God, let me be that kind of man that is yielded and molded that I may flow in the sweetness of the power of the Holy Spirit. We were in a great citywide meeting in a great auditorium. The power of God was so prevalent at night. It was unreal. We had a morning speaker that had been invited, not by Brother Walker, but, but invited by the committee that had ordained that great meeting. And the woman stood and said, And now I'm going to talk in tongues. And my husband's going to tell you what I say. Honey, I got goose apples all over. I bowed my head and began to plead the blood of the Lamb. Honey, you don't play with the Holy Ghost. Turn it off and on because you've got to switch somewhere. Honey, it's a gift. And when you reach the place in God you ought to be, it'll automatically come forth and ring with the clarity of beauty and holiness. Say amen. I want us to put the things back in God's chest. And say, God, I don't mess with those. Those are yours and yours alone. And God, you're the author and the finisher of our faith. If that's what you want me to have, I'll have it. But God, I'm not going to tamper with it because I don't know how to handle it. Say amen. The power of the Holy Spirit. We've watered it down. We've stripped it. We've reprogrammed it. We've retitled it. We've recolored it. We've redoctrined it. We've got new ideas and theories. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He changeth not. Anybody believe that? Neighbor, we've got the real thing. And why should we have a facsimile? Or why should we have a counterfeit? Or why should we have something that looks like it, may act like it, or may feel like it, when we can have the real, genuine anointing of the Holy Spirit and not be in danger of having damnation on our lives? A treasure. My father always had a beautiful antique gun it was a 45 and it was beautiful it always intrigued me and dad set me down one day and he said now stinka i will tell you something the gun is only for you to look at don't ever 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 touch it Yes, Dad. I'd gone away to school. I'd come home. And there still lay that beautiful weapon. And I said, Dad, that thing has always intrigued me since I was five and a half years of age when God healed me of my blindness. I said, do you think I'm old enough now to hold it and look at it? He said, you may be old enough, but before you can use it, you must be taught properly. 
I think God is saying to that to this generation before you start tampering with the unknown God is going to program us to know how to yield to the presence of the Holy Spirit I don't know the formula I don't know how you break it down point A one two three point B one two three but I know when it passes by my sorrow takes flight my pain leaves my worries are vanished because just one touch of his power makes the difference and I told God this afternoon God I'm humbled and Father I am so humbled by that thought that you chose me to share your power but God may I always be worthy and God may I always use it with dignity and with improper order God's power is real and it's the very thing that we need back in our church pews tonight we need it back in our pulpits we need it back in our choirs we need it back at the piano and the organ the drums the saxophone and the guitars because when that is all in its proper order it has a convicting force that sinners cannot neglect and they say something got a hold of me and I'm going to tell you a secret I know what that something is it's God's hook in man's soul it's called power the greatest sermon God ever let me preach it has gone around the world thousands have been printed and reprinted and printed and reprinted again of a sermon I preached on power 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 and neighbor that's the very thing that I'm striving for this beautiful life temple to have in Madisonville Kentucky a touch of God's new anointing power I'm closing now I hope my little talk tonight has reached down beneath the third rib of your soul and you realize how precious the power of God is I'm going to show you an illustration that's going to sort of make you see that what I'm talking about is real I came here on Wednesday night in this church and the front rows of this church were empty the second rows I think there were four people on that one there and maybe five over here mustache kid and his wife sit on the second pew and it was sort of looked like chicken pox over in that area and that area over there looked like a great drought that hit it and no one was sitting on the pews but I want some of you older folks with gray roots and blonde and black ends to look at what I'm going to show you in three nights something's happened it's not because of Jerry B. Walker or Ron Christopher or Gerald Campbell, our sound engineer, our driver. It's not because of we three young chaps that have come to preach and minister to you. But notice, the front seats are not filled with the old shouting, stale saints. it's not the sisters of glitter down here on the front row it's not the men's breakfast club sitting on the front pews it's not the charter members down here the 
the first night the preachers got that front seat and boy they really worked Brother Walker over and I passed they saw that I was real but I saints I want you to look at something it troubles my soul I want you to look what I'm telling you there has been no invitation there has been no drive there has been no giving away a bicycle or giving away bubble gum or giving away a some kind of electronic cuckoo game but look at the front pew tonight it's lined with your children who are hungry to feel and to see and to witness the power of the Holy Spirit A little girl in this church made statement to me last night and I think she's one of the prettiest little girls I've ever seen in my life I told God God if you ever give me any youngins give me one just looks like this she's beautiful but you know what she told brother Walker last night she said I get bored in church but she said, I like it now. Instead of her being bored, where is she seated? On the front seat. No one asked you to sit there, did they, darling? Why did you come down and sit on the front seat tonight? You're just hungry to see Jesus? Yeah. Look at these. Are all of you little girls Pentecostals? No. I know they're not sitting down there because I'm a good-looking young teenage preacher. I'm old enough to be their uncles. Look at that. But why are they here? They're hungry to see what they heard about and saw last night. I look at these beautiful black saints that fill these front pews and you don't know how you honor this preacher. It humbles me to have you saints come and sit on these front pews. You honor this preacher and I love you for it. But I look at a beautiful black man tonight with his gray hair who's been around long enough to be my grandpapa. But tonight he sat on that pew and never once has his back touched it. There has been times that he was sitting on the very edge of that pew and going through his mind he's saying, boy, that young white kid's got it. Now he's telling the truth. And he's saying what we black folks need to hear in the black Methodist and Baptist and Holiness Church. We've been playing church. I said, we've been playing church. I said, we've been playing church. We've been playing Pentecost. We've been playing spirituality. We've been playing dancing and running and leaping. But neighbor, there's a real thing. That when it's over, you'll walk right, talk right, smell right, live right, and pay your tithes in full. Say amen. amen. The power of God. Why? Why do people drive 150 miles from Louisville? They didn't come to here and see Jerry B. Walker. I've got enough sense to know that. There's nobody in this world that would drive 100 miles to see me. But they come because they want to witness the healing power of the Holy Spirit. Woe unto him that resist. Woe unto him that resist. Woe unto him that resist. And now I'm going to tell you something. God at this very moment, hear me. If you don't get this down, it is being recorded and you can buy it immediately after the service out in the lobby. I want you to hear what I'm going to tell you. As sure as I stand before you in a gray silk suit 
As sure as the shoes I've got on my feet are gray and paid for. I'm going to tell you something and don't want you to forget it. God at this very moment is in the process of bringing a last day revival. It will not be a revival of preaching or ability or song or testimonies. But it will be a revival of the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. While God's word is being delivered, lame men will walk out of their wheelchairs. Blind men will scream forth, I see. Cancers will fall out on the aprons or the laps of those that have them. You say, I don't believe it. You come too late to tell this preacher friend, I've been there, I've seen it. Twenty-two years ago, I was in Houston in a great revival meeting. And a woman came to the healing line who had cancer in the roof of her mouth. And all I said was, dear sweet Jesus. And the cancer fell out on my white shoe and wiggled like a great big octopus. A nurse came and put it in a jar. And they took it to Anderson Hospital. The woman is still well. She's still healed. You come too late to tell me the power of God doesn't work. The Louisville folks will remember an incident in Louisville. When at the close of the service, I said, The Lord just showed me a lady. You're back over there under the balcony. And you only have one contact lens on, and, you're, and it's on the left eye. There's no way in the world I could see a contact lens on anyone's eye. And no, they just had one. That woman had resisted the entire meeting, but honey, she ran down that aisle. And before she got to me, that beautiful lace dress she was wearing, all of a sudden I looked at her laying down the green grass carpet. That's the power of God. Neighbor, we don't need men to do their thing. We need for God once again to be himself. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. We need his power. Neighbor, we don't need a has-been preacher. We don't need a man that who knows how to read it and cock it by word by word. But we need who men who will stand and tell you there is power in the blood of the Lamb. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Glory! Glory! Lift up your hands and magnify Jehovah God. Lift up your hands and wave back to heaven. Glory! Hallelujah. 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 He that resisteth bringeth unto himself damnation. Never in any generation has there been as many sick people as they are today. You know why? We've resisted the healer. No longer. Should we have to say, I've got nerve problems, I, I'm uptight, I, I'm going to get analyzed. Uh, honey, the great analyst, uh, his name is Jehovah Jireh God. He knows how to make you whole. But we resist. We resist. We resist. We back up and say, God, whoa! I'm too rich. You bless me. I've got three bedrooms and two parties. And God, don't blab with me now. I don't need all. Honey, when you need it the most is when you're at the top of the mountain. Because remember, at every top, there's a valley for you to go through. The Bible said, beware when your houses have been filled and your land has prospered and gold has increased and your flocks and herds have multiplied. And then you forget God. Resisting. Resisting. Neighbor, who am I to resist the Savior of my soul? Who are you to resist? The man who took the stripes that you might be made whole. Who are you to resist the man who wants you to weep? Neighbor, he wept. And I look at him and he said, where are those that were with me? Here I am in travail and no one is here to help me. Neighbor, God's looking for men to get ready to leave this world. 
but one of these days there's going to be a great suction and a great vacuum but only those that are going there are going to be those whose names are written in the book of life and who have not resisted the power mm, I'm about to preach just about to preach but I look at a man here on the front seat that I love and his wife are like my kinfolks I prayed for him today twice I look at mustache I didn't know you were a Methodist nobody told me you were a Methodist until today he's Methodist but you know why he came to this church not to be Methodist not to see us be Presbyterian or Lutheran Episcopalian or burn our incense and our candles he came to feel the Holy Ghost power of Jehovah God And if he don't see what he came to see, he's going to find a place where he can see the power of the living God. Mm. Father, mm. the power, the power, woe unto him that resisteth, for he bringeth unto himself damnation I believe it Father in thy name every head is bowed and every eye is closed across this great audience can I see a hand of a man a woman a boy a girl who would say Jerry B. Walker I am a sinner but I want Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sins would you lift up your hand quickly Anywhere, there's one, two, anywhere else. You may put them down. Anywhere else. Brother Walker, I am a sinner. God bless you, sister. I see your sweet hand. Three, four. Preacher, I am a sinner. Brother Walker, I am a sinner. I am lost. Anywhere else. Let me see your hand quickly, quickly, quickly. On the left, that's five. Thank you. Anywhere else? Yes, I see your hand, young man. God love your sweet soul. Anywhere else? Brother Walker, I'm a sinner. I'm not trying to fake it. I'm not trying to put it on. Brother Walker, I am a sinner. Anywhere else? Anywhere else? All right, my second call is this. Brother Walker... There's no use to color it any other color. There's use to call it any other name. But Jeremy, I am backslidden. I've lost out with God. And I know I do not have what I ought to have in my heart. I am a backslider. I want to see your hand quickly. Up, up quickly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Anywhere else? Nine, ten. Anywhere else? Brother Walker, I am a backslider. I have lost out with God. Anywhere else? There's eight. Anywhere else? Quickly. All right. I'm going to ask the audience to stand. Quickly. No one leaving this auditorium. No moving, no talking, no visiting, and no changing recipes. We are going to respect the power of God tonight or I'll know the reason why. I want every head bowed and I want every eye closed. That's exactly what I want done. No one looking. No one looking. Every head is bowed. Mamas, saints, pray. There are five sinners in this building tonight who are lost and going to hell. They're lost. They're lost. If the Lord were to come tonight, they'd split hell wide open. They're lost. But God's power is dealing with them. It wasn't a salvation sermon I preached to the saints. But neighbor, when the power of God is present, it convicts the sinner. Eight backsliders said, I'm backslid and I've lost out with God. Now then, I'm going to do what God told me to do this afternoon. I want every one of you that are a sinner or a backslider, maybe you didn't lift your hand, but you're honest and you want God to come into your life. 
I want you to step from where you are and come stand here with me in front right now, quickly. Come on. No one's looking. Every head is bowed. If you lifted your hand, step out from where you are. They're coming. They're coming from all over the building. Come on. Beautiful. They're coming weeping. The Holy Spirit is moving. They're coming. Men are stepping out. Grown daddies are stepping out. Lost. Come on. Young people who are backslidden and lost. Come on. Let's tell it like it is. Let's be honest. Brother Walker, I'm in a backslidden state. I'm lost. Come on. I'm waiting. If you lifted your hand, step out now in the name of Jesus. Come on. Young teenager, come on, sweetheart. Come on. I want to pray just with you, darling. The Holy Spirit's dealing with you, sugar. Come on. They're still coming. Three out of the five sinners have come. There's two more sinners in the audience. There's two more sinners in the audience. There's two more sinners in the audience who lifted their hand. I'm waiting quickly. Come on. Young man, you say, but well, Brother Walker, I'm with a lady tonight. That's all right. Leave her standing right there. And she'll be the happiest lady in the world to see your soul made right with God. She may have been praying for you. She may have been a fasting for you. She may got you here tonight for the very reason for your soul to be made right with God. Come on, brother. They're still coming. They're still coming. Yes, they're still coming. Big old bruises are coming down these aisles. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory! 